Hi, I'm Dr. Neil Cox from the University of Reading, and this is the last of my short lectures on um, I, I'm Dr. Neil Cox from the University of Reading, and this is the last of my um, four really short lectures on uh, look, we have coming to Dover, um, the popular uh, poem from the Ford collection. Um, I'm going to try and make this one very, very quick. If this is the um, first one in this series you've seen, uh, go back uh, to the beginning and watch them from there, it'll make a lot more sense. And I should also add here that I'm going to do some more um, of these talks about some other poems from that collection. But this, this poem is just about um, the connection um, between this poem and Dover Beach by Arnold. Um, we know already that um, there's a brief, brief quote from this uh, poem Dover Beach at the start of look we have uh, coming to Dover and quite often what, what, I, um, what, I, what I hear from students is that that's meant to be about a contrast between a kind of romanticised, idealised 19th century fantasy about um, the beach cliffs, water around England, but also an idea of um, a kind of a Victorian fantasy about variety in the future. Basically the idea is Dover Beach is read as a really optimistic poem um, with a really sunny, idealised um, notion of um, the world. And what look we are com uh, have coming to Dover is meant to do is counteract that by showing some of the harsh realities of modern life. The problem with that is, is it just, it doesn't really work. Um, uh, Dover Beach is, is not a happy poem. Yeah, it, it's not. There's some real connections between them. Certainly, we could say that there is a contrast in the first stanza of um, uh, Dover Beach, and I'll put a poem at the bottom of this um, this video. There is a real contrast between um, the sea as it's understood um, in Arnold's poem and the sea as it's understood in Look, We Have Come Into Dover. In Arnold's poem, it, it's about a tranquil bay. There's a long line of spray. Everything is at peace. And that's clearly very different from the uh, lash of fresco of a diesel breeze, the gobfuls of surf phlegmed and the rest of it. At the end we've got the flecked cliffs and, and this, this, these image of kind of additions and spitting but also kind of industrialization and, and violence and, and tourism and busyness are kind of all over um, uh, the more recent poem um, compared to the kind of gentle softness in Arnold's poem but that gentle softness in Arnold's poem is is a sad softness the poem you know it really at its most simple level um, says come to window my love hear the sound of the waves going in and out as the tide goes out that's the sound of a tide receding and there's something else that's receding in life at the moment and that's faith religious faith is going just as the tide is going and we should be happy together because although it might seem that life's grand and the future's bright in reality we're in a hellish place and it's going to get worse. So it's a pretty dark 
dark poem. I, I would make I'll make kind of two observations here. The, the first is in the second stanza of Dover Beach, Arnold makes a connection between hearing the waves going in and out now in Britain and those that heard that same sound in a way in ancient Greece. Sophocles long ago heard it on the Aegean, he says, of the sound of the waves. And it brought into his mind the turbid ebb and flow of human misery. We find also in the sound of thought, hearing it by this distant northern sea, the sea of faith. So there is a connection here made between us in Britain hearing the sound and Sophocles in ancient Greece hearing this sound. So already that idea about the relationship between countries and people in countries is being addressed in both poems. And a connection is made because both Sophocles and Arnold are hearing the same thing, but then there is a difference. And so it is about the difference between countries and experiences. Because what Sophocles heard is something very specific. Uh, the ebb and flow of human misery. For Sophocles, actually, this is, this is a kind of a universal sound. But for the narrator of Dover Beach, the we is hearing something, yeah, much more definite. And it's about a specific crisis in faith, uh, the sea of faith retreating. The second thing I would say is, is turn to the last stanza of Dover Beach. You know, as I said, it's not a happy poem. Our love, let us be true to one another. Oh, so there, there is a, such a clear connection in the language between the two poems, this, this appeal to the love. Although in Look We Are Coming to Dover, it's not necessarily a statement to the love. Here, the two people are very much more isolated together, not part of a more collective hour. For the world which seems to lie before us like a land of dreams, so various, so beautiful, so new, hath really neither joy, nor love, nor light, nor certitude, nor peace, nor help from pain. We are here as on a darkling plain, swept with confusion alarms of struggle and flight where ignorant armies clash by night. If there is a difference between these two poems, at the end and there is, it's not that the Victorian poem, the 19th century poem, you know, is all jolly and hopeful, and the contemporary poem has a kind of a, a realistic understanding of um, difficulties. It's rather that the contemporary poem ends in hope. However ambivalent, ambivalent and blared and political and compromised and naive that hope might be, it's a hope unchallenged, you know. It's Dover Beach that sees any thought of hope abjured. It's Dover Beach that sees no peace, no certitude, and no help from pain. It's Dover Beach that problematizes narratives of hope. And it's really important to think about that clear um, difference if one is going to appeal to uh, intertextual connections when writing about uh, look we are coming